welcome everyone to a girl and a flamingo podcast my name is ren and let's get into tonight's episode where else are you gonna be talking about orlando and skunk ape lights that follow your car at night a chair that you sit in at midnight that you can talk to the devil and a cursed strip of i4 that is said to bring misery to those that travel down it. Are y'all ready? Join me and let's start the episode. Today's paranormal word of the week is the witching hour. So you've probably heard about the witching hour or watch out for the witching hour when you were little. I know I heard it is the witching hour. According to lore, the witching hour happens anywhere from 12 a.m to 4 a.m. Talk about what the witching hour is. Witching hour is just a when the veil between the physical world world and the spiritual world ghosts, demons, witches, and angels becomes thin and all these entities come over here and visit us, haunt us, torture us, depending on who you ask. There is a lot of speculation about what type of entities come out and when. There is a popular notion in pop culture that the witching hour generally happens around 3 a.m. That came from the movie The Conjuring when Ed Warren talks about the witching hour being at 3 a.m. due to the fact that Jesus Christ died at 3 p.m. Because of that, the devil is opposite of Jesus Christ. 3 a.m. is the opposite of 3 p.m. and that is when demons come out. What are a couple of more tales around the witching hour? The witching hour is also said to be a prime time for ghosts. Ghosts only show up during this time. There's some speculation to how much truth there is. For example, people have reported sightings of ghosts while they've been in their bed around 12 to 3 a.m. and some mediums say that they're active during the witching hour. According to several paranormal investigators, witching hour doesn't exist because they have been there at all hours of the day and have had experiences and it doesn't matter what hour it is. Also, the witching hour is when witches are able to get their conjuring and their magic use more effectively. Does the witching hour exist? Is it lore? Several paranormal investigators have said the only reason there is a lore of a witching hour is because it's when most of us are asleep. When we wake up, we think we see that shadow at the end of the bed looking out at us. Or if you unfortunately have sleep paralysis, we'll see things you normally wouldn't see because sleep paralysis kind of mess with our brains. So reports of ghosts, bump in the night. But does the hour exist? I'll leave that up to you to decide. Okay, y'all, are you ready? We're gonna be getting started on tonight's topic. We're gonna be talking about the folklore around the Orlando area. Okay, let's get into today's episode. So as I said earlier, this episode is about a couple of folklore famous around the Orlando area. Tonight, I am going to be talking about four of those legends that are known around here or well known around here. First one I want to talk about is the Skunk Ape. The Skunk Ape is said to be Florida's own version of Bigfoot. Where does the story come from though? It turns out Skunk Ape does have some roots in history. Back in 1977, there was a report of someone having a run in with a large half man half ape creature or as weird us calls it in their article a type of humanoid skunk ape has its roots come from the Kissimmee area turns out the skunk ape legend goes back to early native american legends and the native american legends speak of giants living along the Kissimmee river the sand people and the mangrove people these legends were said to dis- the reports were similar later uh, reports of skunk ape are the skunk apes real let's move up a little bit to 1935 but workers were excavated around a native american mound earthed a human thigh bone that was as long as a man's whole leg there was several footprints that were huge larger than an average human 
foot that were found on this archaeological dig. Now someone could say this was probably way back when before Native Americans settled here before Spaniards came along. Let's go back to that 1971 when people reported seeing this humanoid. Probably think, okay, they're trippy, they were on something, but there have been several encounters as different people have stated, seen something, a skunk ape, or a half man, half ape, or a wooly, hairy human. Let's talk about a 1997 filmed interview from Paul Schmidt, and it was located in New Smyrna. He was hanging out one morning after sunrise when he said that he saw a big human-like beast. He turned, he immediately was turning his pickup around when on the dirt road, uh, the creature appeared in headlights. He explained that it was very big, had long hair, gray hair, and it wasn't anything remotely resembling a bear. Could, then he could see its face, only the middle part of his body. Described the skunk egg smell as something rotten cabbage. So bad that he almost gagged and almost vomited. That bad job. Oh, could you imagine running into something that looks human and smells? Oh my gosh, I would be so scared right there. And the smell alone would have made me run for the hell. What makes Paul's story unique compared to everyone else who has said that they've had an encounter with a skunk ape? Well, there have been three separate stories about the skunk ape appearing in the area that he said he saw it in. There was a hunter from Melbourne that found several large footprints and he made the plaster cast. In the decade before that, girl suffered a broken arm after being thrown from her horse when a large humanoid type 8 man cross her path. This area is known as a vast wilderness area is the state Florida the parks is in charge of that area and it's known as the St. John's Wildlife Management Area. Because of there's very few highways that cut through the area so a lot of a large animal could move easily around without being seen by humans. Of course there's probably not going to be a lot of reports about so let's talk about some more encounters. In 1966 a woman had her car break down near Brooksville and she got out and realized that she had a flat and while she was getting out starting to fix her car get that spare ready she said that she noticed something like a man a shadow of a man right across the street from her she just ignored it went about her business but then she noticed or smelled a strange odor like something was rotting something was near and then she heard a heavy footsteps on the opposite side of the road and she turned around and to her horror she saw a seven foot tall eight bug like creature as she described it a human like creature with shaggy dark fur of course as she finished quickly and got out of there but it was a horror story let's talk about february of 1971 when five archaeologists excavating a native american mound in the big cypress swamp reported some type of beast had crashed into their camp in the middle of the night and wrecked their campground before running off into the swamp land. The reports are saying it's a large biped primate and I am reading off the site here because there is no other way to describe it other than what the reports say. Large biped primate did not have it be at 7 to 8 feet tall and almost 700 pounds and he was covered with white fur. Let us talk about that last the last story that will send chills up your spine. So in the 70s, there was a report of a man at a restaurant and a couple of people that ran into the skunk ape. The skunk ape, they ran into him. The skunk ape dragged the trucker for a couple of feet until he finally escaped and got in his truck and drove away. With all this eyewitness and some physical evidence, is there any any physical proof that the skunk ape exists well that depends on who you ask some videos out there people catching the reported skunk ape and there's where they're just hanging on the train and i'm going to link that down in the description if you want to check that out the florida fish and wildlife commission says they are they know about the skunk ape and they said they permits there is no full solid proof that they have seen this ape, ape. what what do y'all think i leave it up to you do you think florida has their own legit Bigfoot. Just let me know. You're always welcome to comment on all forms of social media. Get on to the second folklore legend of the night of the Orlando area and that Ovido Lights. 
The Ovido Lights, unlike a lot of stuff that we talk about on our podcast, the Ovido Lights have 100% been seen by passers-by. So the Ovido Lights are located on a road between Chilada and Snow Hill as you're crossing the Ikalonkachi River Bridge. What makes these lights so unique is like I said, they are, people have seen them, there are reports of these eerie lights to chase your cars while you're on the bridge. What makes these unique is they are actually a phenomenon and scientists have studied them have said they're nothing more than swamp gas comes off of the swamp during the warm summer night. Before any of you say well it could be ghosts, the only reports of the Ovido light have been reported during the summer months which gives credence to different scientists have said about these lights. There are, let's talk about some of the reports where people have said that these cannot be swamp lights because they chase your car. Swamp gas does not chase, it just goes up and rises into an air. It kind of looks like an eerie otherworldly glow while it just dissipates off into that air. There have been reports sometimes with these lights there will come these ghostly apparitions, wailing, screaming, crying, run-of-the-mill tech books, stories that you'll hear about hauntings of bridge. There's also once person said that there was such a bad haunting and such a loud wailing, a ghostly welling and lights that the river ran backwards with the light right after it happened. This spot is popular with the teenagers of the area to go and try to have a little dates, you know, catch the lights, just do that teenage fun thrill-seeking thing that we all do when we're in high school. We go to the nearest haunt of the area. Like a lot of the legends we've talked about here, the Ovido lights do not have any particular story or history behind them. There is no Native American lore there is no one that died a violent death. There is nothing that would suggest, even paranormal, paranormal investigators would suggest would constitute an, a haunt. Is it haunted? Probably not, but it's a cool urban legend. And if you're ever up there, I'd highly recommend going there to get some pictures because it, it is hauntingly beautiful. Okay, so that was a very short legend. Next up, we're going to talk about something a little more intense known as the Devil's Chair. The Devil's Chair is located in Casadega, Florida, and this chair is, hold on one second here, is located a mile up the road in Lake Helen Cemetery. This chair is very common. A lot of people go there during, during Halloween when the teenagers dare each other to sit in the chair. Now the lore around this is if you sit in the chair around midnight, the devil will come and talk to you. Also, if you put in an open can of beer around midnight, the next morning the beer will be open and the can will be empty. So this chair, is there any is there anything to it? According according to a medium, there is nothing to this story. It's just a local lore that was started to give a little bit of pizzazz to that area. The real story that it was built back in the 20s with by a man who recently lost his wife. She died a very quick death and he was still in shock. So he, when she was buried, he walked there each day and sat beside her grave. He did have arthritis and the, the walk was going to be hard on him and he still wanted to visit his wife every day and you know, talk to her, be close to her. As a result of needing somewhat something to sit on, he spilt the big brick chair that rested beside his wife's grave. This chair was good, would be later to be known to be the devil's chair. Stories would start coming out about sitting in the chair and hearing the devil talk to you. Even though mediums and folklorists have said there is nothing to this story other than to add a little drama, there are people that have sat in the chair who have claimed that they have heard voices and seen shadows lurking. One report has stated once they sat in the chair, they heard voices in their mind, and the minute they stood up, the voices stopped. A lot of people who are dared to sit on this chair will not because they are terrified because they see dark shadows lurking in the cemetery. So quick little story for you about some of the legend around Orlando. So our final stop is going to be something known as the I-4 Dead Zone and buckle up. This is going to be a long and rich field story about an area that is so well known around the Orlando area that it makes people shake in their boots. I-4. So for those of you 
who are Orlando locals, you know that I-4 is pretty much synonymous with the word wreck. In fact, at one point and at one point in the last couple of years, I-4 was one of the deadliest roads or deadliest interstates in the United States. And that is that is quite a title for a interstate that runs from Tampa to Daytona and runs through the central Florida area. So what could make this road even more deadly? Well, as it there is a notorious section of I-4 that has been dubbed the I-4 dead zone. I-4 dead zone is halfway between Daytona and Orlando, Florida. It is a bridge that crosses the St. Johns River and there is such a eerie story below the bridge that it has sparked so much stories around it and so much fear that a lot of people do not even venture down it when they're going to Daytona. Let's talk about the legend that surrounds it because it un there's a lot of history that surrounds this area. Let's go back in time to 1870s when that area was part of a land grant owned by Henry Sanford who was the head of the Florida Land and Colonization Company. So in 1886 a small railroad station was built and the area was planted into parcels of land in order to start a small Roman Catholic colony called St. Joseph's. Sanford who ironically the town of Sanford is named after but let's get back into the story he believed that he could unload some real estate that attracted the German immigrants to this small St. Joseph's colony he did appoint a Catholic priest that oversaw the entire settlement unfortunately his plans to build a small medium-sized community were a little bit in vain when only four immigrant families settled in the St. John's area. St. Joseph's never, no, was fulfilled the way Sanford wanted it to. So in 1887, very shortly after St. Joseph started, there was an outbreak of yellow fever that wiped out all members of a family. So there were four people in that family and they all died from the yellow fever. There was fear in that community that the yellow fever was going to be contagious, so the bodies were taken and buried in the woods nearby. The priest was called to Tampa shortly afterwards so he could you know, do ministry with the yellow fever victims over there. But shortly after he moved to Tampa, he died of the yellow fever and he never made it back to St. Joseph's. After he died, because he was one of the only people that knew where the graves were, with his death, the unknown of those graves was taken with him. In 1890, the little community of St. Joseph evolved into a small town known as Lake Monroe that was named for the local lake in the area. The land that had the grave sites on them was purchased by a farmer named D.V. Warren. He cleared the entire for farming. While he was clearing the land, he found these four small graves and he decided to farm around them, thereby creating a tiny little island so these four members of the family could lay there undisturbed. When a man named Albert S. Hawkins bought the land from Mr. Warren in 1905, he also took advice from Warren, left the graves in their little island and farmed around the area. They kind of coexisted together where the dead would not be disturbed and they were respected and the land would be cultivated for farming. Let's go back before we go back into how graves were completely lost to history. Let's go back to the origin. Now no one is sure for exactly if these immigrants were D Dutch or German. Now Lord early storytellers hold that, that these were actually Dutch settlers because files that it said Deutsch, which Deutsch is is a common term for German immigrants or Germans. As a result, they were put down as Germans rather than Dutch. But again, they could be German. No one knows for sure. Let's go back. So Mr. Hawkins would lease his land out to different farmers so they can farm, use the land, make their living. And he always warned them about disturbing the graves while they were farming. That worked out well until one farmer decided to be a little bit adventurous and he tried to remove the wire fence that surrounded the graves. And on that very same day, house was burned down. In the early 1950s, a small boy Boy tried to dig up one of the graves and the next night he was killed by a drunk driver 
who was never identified. Weird things also began to happen in Mr. Hawking's home, which sat on the edge of the field where the graves were. There is a rumor that the Hawking's home burned down when Mr. Hawking's tried to remove the rotten wooden markers. So far, these graves are creep- have a lot of creepy going on around them, like, definitely telling people do not disturb us or suffer the consequences. So what else? So what else is there? Probably something creepy enough to you. You're probably like, oh gosh, is that the end of the story? It turns out there is so much more to this story. So buckle up. We are only halfway through the through the legend of I-4 and all mystery that surrounds it. Mrs. Hawkins blamed the fire on the graves. And Mr. Hawkins was like, yep, nope. And then he just quick, he just quickly replaced the gravestones as soon as he can just in case you don't want to mess with that bad juju <laughs> they built a new house and they were as soon as they built a new house they were pl there were events that happened immediately in that new house that were unexplainable that involved children's toys. They said that a small child's rocker would rock by itself and the toys would roll around with no one there pushing them. So with all that, all the really scary stuff going on, the Hawkins Field was finally called the Field of the Dead. The Field of the Dead was a folk history that was passed down until 1909, until a brochure that was happened to be found by a historian of St. Joe's Colony was unearthed. The historian went on a quest find out about St. Joseph's colony and she ultimately found what happened the horrible ill-flated Ill destiny the St. Joseph's colony had run into. In 1959 Mrs. Hawkins and her by that time her husband was dead so she ran the farm up till 1959 she sold the farm to the government to begin the construction on their new interstate that would become to known as Interstate 4. While the government was surveying for the interstate the four Graves were stumbled upon, and they were marked for their relocation, but somehow, no one thought to move them. In 1960, the construction crew filled dirt. Filled dirt was dumped on the family's grave so they could elevate the new highway. And this is where the story takes a turn for the really, really strange and honestly destructive. The same day that that filled dirt, or a couple of... A couple days after the filter was put, Hurricane Donna made an unexpected turn towards Central Florida. Hurricane Donna at that time was in making a trip to the Gulf Coast and was hitting South Florida, rated as one of Florida's most powerful hurricanes. It was expected for Donna to hit the tip of Florida and go towards the Gulf of Mexico and kind of go towards the Gulf of Mexico and eventually make its way to Tampa. Here's where it gets weird. Before Donna hit Tampa, it's turned northeast across the Florida Peninsula and her path was parallel to the I-4 dead zone, as it was known at the time, the surveyed route of that new highway. In fact, the storm's eye passed directly over the graves right at midnight on September 10th, as Donna's fury was one of the worst in Central Florida's history at that time. Definitely, definitely, it was, at this point, it was, please do not mess with, was given out a do not mess with these graves vibe. Even the weather's like, do not mess with these graves. As a result of the, the aftermath of Donna caused, caused an interruption in the highway construction around that area because of flooding and other perceived, and these problems lasted for nearly a month. Finally, after all the trouble, the I-4 was open. But on the same day that I-4 was open, a tractor trailer got into an accident and turned over and dumped all of its frozen shrimp on, on the bridge that is known as the I-4 dead zone. The very first day, not three days, not four days, the very first day they opened it. Now the driver said that he did not have any controls, like suddenly something took over the wheel and it just mysteriously start, had its own mind and started controlling itself and somehow jackknife right above the graves. Let's get into this a little more because by no means is this the end of the weirdness that is I-4 dead zone. Not only did Hurricane Donna and Rex happen, there is estimated that between the time I-4 opened and 1996, the time it opened and now, there have been anywhere from 1,400 to 2,000 wrecks in that area alone, 
with a high probability of fatalities. No one has any definite record of how many wrecks happened on that bridge. What else is there about this strange, strange bridge? Not only have the wrecks been the defining moment or the defining event of the I-4 dead zone, 2004, while they were making improvements on and around the graves, a couple of days later, after the improvement started, Hurricane Charlie almost followed the same path that Donna took and went up straight those area once again, causing unmitigated damage. After this, the local medium came by I-4 after all these events happened and called it the Field of the Dead and warned people to not mess with this area because of the graves and all the dead that were in. Go back to 1995 really quick because I want to point out an important fact that I forgot to point out while I was talking about the storms. Let's talk about a fact that I forgot to mention between 1995 and 1997. Between those two years, there were 44 car crashes that ended up injuring a total of 65 people. Here is where it's crazy. So if you add up 44 plus 65, your total is going to be 109. In 1996, the Dutch family that unfortunately that passed away from the yellow fever, the graves underneath I-4, it would have been 109 years since they died. So that is crazy, crazy, crazy coincidence. The people that drive over this have reported that their phones do not work will die that they while they're on a call with someone they'll hear voices saying why who are you and some have it reported laughing and growls over their phone not only that some have said their car will t get a mind of its own and they will have no control over driving in the area the radios will die like i said the phones will die and there is sightings there's reports of orbs and there's reports of figures, including a woman in white. It is clear from this story that there is something that is supernatural that may not be able to explain. Rex, a lot of people say, well, I-4 is very dangerous, which is true. I-4 does have a high number of wrecks and fatalities for a small interstate. Some people will say that it's I-4 itself that's the problem and that there's too much, there's a lot of people that live here too much congestion and that the hurricanes that was just coincidence winds everything that's scientific but there is definitely some there that cannot be explained by our modern science or anything of the sort and if anyone were to read the signs it would be clear that some theme or someone is telling the state of florida and the people and the citizens of florida to not tamper with those graves and to stay away and let them rest in peace if this is just a lore this is a cautionary tale of what happens when a government becomes overpopulated and starts overdeveloping land that should be left alone such as our beautiful nature a beautiful forest and people's graves which unfortunately throughout the united states they do build on grave sites which is an unfortunate of overdevelopment and needs to be looked into. Well, I hope that you enjoyed the folklore surrounding the Orlando area. This episode was a little bit longer due to the rich history surrounding several of these locations, primarily the I-4 dead zone. Wanted to get into the details of I-4 dead zone because it is so interesting and so complex that you cannot explain it without explaining its entire history. Next week, we're gonna be talking about ladies in white. What makes this story so common throughout the United States and several parts of the world? Why is this a common theme? Why do people, why, why do people when they report to ghosts often say they see a lady in white and the significance behind the lady in white? And we'll also look into reports and there's several reports that there's le legitimate reports and whether or not these stories are true a little bit of housekeeping before i sign off for the night this podcast has a facebook now an instagram and a youtube yes 
finally we have those. Got them set up last week. If you want to go ahead, head over to those. I will leave the links on our website. And feel free to head on over. I post it on YouTube for those of you who prefer to hear podcasts on YouTube. And please go on these and feel free to leave me a comment. Anything you want to hear about. Maybe some improvements. I'm still new at this. And I still want to cover topics that are interesting related to supernatural and eerie events. All right, y'all. Well, that is the end of the story for the night. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And.